we know that we're told that in this new system, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Mm. I, I think you'll own nothing if you're not prepared, but I'm pretty sure you won't be happy. But in this transition, they needed to, to legally own everything. So what you're looking at here is a study that was done by Yale, a custodial ownership chart, because when you deposit money into your into your brokerage account, you think that those are your stocks? No, 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 no. Most likely they are held in street name. I was a new stockbroker in the eighties. I remember the big push to get assets in house. They paid you to do that so that they could use your equity for their benefit. So here's the legal owner right up here, DD, DTC and Seed and Company. And here's you as the beneficial owner way down here. And everybody in between is also a beneficial owner. That's why nobody went to jail in 2008, because while what they did was disgusting and evil and horrendous and destroyed a lot of people's lives and livelihood, it wasn't illegal. And guess what? It's still not illegal. So street name holders are not technically entitled to vote. They don't really own anything or grant proxy authority. Those rights only reside with DTC as the legal owner of all street name shares. You are not the legal owner. You are the beneficial owner and DTC registers its shares and company share registers under the name of seed and company. Now who owns DTC and who owns seed and company? all these commercial banks and these large financial institutions. So they make up the rules. They certainly have enough money to help pass all the laws and they get, I don't know, more benefits than you. You take the risk, you pay the fees, they get the benefits because they can legally use your equity for their benefit. That's crazy is what you're saying to me. Well, unfortunately it is not crazy at all. It is the way the system is set up. Don't take my word for it. Do your own due diligence. But I would say that it's time to protect yourself as much as possible because in 95, the banks needed more money to gamble with. And so they passed reg D. This is important because it sets up the bail in that is legal today. The DTC of the, I'm sorry, Reg D encourages leverage and at risk deposits because it sweeps whatever you deposit into the account into sub accounts in the bank's name. That's what gives them the authority to use your equity for their benefit. And it also is cheaper for them because it does not, they don't have to put, put, money on reserve in case you pull those deposits out. See, so it's like a win-win, but it really makes things a lot riskier for depositors and they don't even realize it, but they call this deposit reclassification. Isn't that nice? And guess how you agreed to it? Well, you just kept using the account, but it definitely diminishes investor protections and it sets the stage for bail-ins. So what's the bail in? Well, you know, this was tested back in 2013 in Cyprus and then, and I'm going to show you that in a second, but then the uh, bank for international settlements, which is the central banker, central bank came in and formalized and gave the world a template on what this would look like. And what I think is interesting is that the first bar chart shows with no insured deposits. So in Cyprus, they just took everybody's money, period. And then the whole world went, oh wait, what about deposit insurance? What about deposit insurance? So then they backed off and they honored that. Although people still had no access to their funds for a number of years after they did the bail-in. And if you had money in there and they bailed it in, you were not getting it back. Just that simple. So let me show you what that looked like. This is the, the five third, the May 3rd, 2013 
test because they needed to see how people would react. So they run these tests way over there. So you could go, why are you talking to me about this, Lynette? That's in Cyprus. I live in America. That could never happen here. Well, it's legal if it happens here and they needed to see what people would do. But what I want to show you in this that I think is so interesting, this red line are domestic deposits. So that would be like you and me depositing into our account. This black line were German and French banks. And you can see that when Cyprus became part of the EU, they had higher interest rates. So your German and French banks made lots and lots of deposits into 2000, like mid 2010. But these mail-in things, these plans, they don't just happen on the fly. So isn't it quite interesting that while domestic deposits stayed very stable, all of a sudden German and French banks got the Hades out of Dodge. Hmm. Then, there was a bail-in. Hmm, is that a coincidence? I'll let you decide. Personally, I don't think it's a coincidence, but you can decide. These are, just, these are just the facts. You get to formulate your own opinion. So they've run this test and they, and it's based on eminent domain laws because you know, the government can take anything they want as long as they pay you fairly for it well, what you end up, what these depositors end up with were shares in failing institutions. Hmm. Who decided how much those were worth? Hmm. Maybe the failing institutions. And what are you going to do with shares in a failing institution anyway? I mean, really. But hey, eminent domain law is satisfied, bail in complete, too bad, so sad, nothing you can do about it. And by the way, CDs and bonds were also converted into shares of stock in the failing institution. So I get a lot of people that ask me, well, what about CDs? What about bank bonds? Well, there you go. Now, a lot of the problems that created the speculative derivative problems that created uh, what happened in 2008, well, they haven't gone away. They've just been papered over and they're just floating out there. But as you can see from this graph, from the office of the comptroller of the currency that tracks derivatives in the FDIC insured US bank deposits or depositories, the level of derivatives are much higher today than they were in 2007, 2008. And much of it is still kind of similar to the derivatives that were created before that. As long as you keep paying the fees, they don't have to settle. However, banks generate a huge chunk of their revenue by trading these derivative contracts with your deposits, even though you don't know it because you don't see it. Doesn't matter. Insured U.S. commercial banks and savings associations reported trading revenue of $12.7 billion in the third quarter of 2022. That is $2.4 billion more or 22.9%. So they love this volatility because it enables them to make a whole lot more money and also maybe some losses, but 20, almost 23% greater than the previous quarter or 84.1% higher than a year earlier. That's significant, don't you think? Because I sure do. I mean, they made 84.1% more than a year earlier. That's crazy. And this is all based on the derivatives in the FDIC insured banks. So there's far more that are speculative than our end user. This is your trading revenue right up here, the speculation. Derivative notional amounts in the third quarter of 2022 was 195.1 trillion. 142 trillion are in interest rate derivatives. Now, remember a derivative is just a big leveraged bet. It's not like they can convert anything into the underlying. 
So with most derivative contracts concentrated in interest rates, when the central bank was using their forward guidance to tell you, in other words, telling Wall Street, this is what we're going to do so they could get into position to benefit from it. It hurts you, but it benefits them because it should be pretty clear that banks are too big to fail. You and I were the right sizes, but the banks are not. So 72.8 of total notional value derivatives are in interest rate related products. And we can see the battle on interest rates that are happening in the markets right now on what's happening with bonds. What's going to happen next? I don't know. We'll find out though, won't we?